Hey, hey everyone. We will be starting the seminar pretty shortly. So if anyone just shows up in the waiting room, uh, can you please notify us in the chat? Because we're not going to be checking it actively anymore. But we're also going to be recording the seminar and then sharing it on Discord and Piazza for you guys to watch later. Uh, I don't actually have the public Discord. Is it? Do you have it, Teresa? Okay, so basically, you can just go to the website amacss.org, and then the social media links will be on. The website. I think we're good to go. Uh, do you want to Yeah, I'm good to go. I was just testing something on my computer. Sorry about that. No um, worries. So today for the seminar, we will be discussing the following topics. We're going to be talking about lists, tuples, and sets. We will be comparing them and talking about the different methods you can use to solve different problems using them. We will also be talking about dictionaries and files because we learned that all of these topics showed up in either the PCRs or the lectures. Um, if there's any additional topics that you would like us to talk about, you can notify us in the chat and we will try to include something about it either at the end or whenever. And we're also going to be giving you guys some practice questions that and for each practice question, we will give you about five to 10 minutes to answer each one. So let's just get started. So I'm gonna start with list tuples and sets. List tuples and sets are structures that can store a collection of items. So here, when you, dec you can declare and initialize list tuples and sets like this. So list can be declared use and initialized using these square brackets. Tuples can be used can use regular brackets and sets can use the curly brackets. Um, just to take just note that lists and tuples can repeat I'd have repetitions of items in them and sets cannot. So to begin, when you want to access items from lists and tuples, you can use an index method that works the exact same way as the index method does for strings. You can also check if an item is present in any list or tuple using the index and count methods. So you would simply just, the syntax for that would simply just be my collection dot index dot index brackets. And then the parameter will be item where item is the value you're looking for in either the tuple or the list. And for counting, the syntax would be my collection dot count. And then in brackets, you would put the item where um, the index method returns the smallest index of the item or negative one if the item is not present in either the tuple or the list that you want to look for the item in. 
And then the count method returns the number of times an item is present in the collection. It either returns a number greater than or equal to zero. And if it returns zero, that means the item is not present in the list or the tuple. So for all list tuples and sets, you would basically, to check whether an item is present in, in the collection, you would just use the syntax item in my collection where item is the item you're looking for and my collection is the collect is the list, the tuple or the set. And the statement evaluates to true if the item is in the collection and false otherwise. You have to remember that set items are unordered, so you cannot use indexes to access items. And every set will either include an item only once or it won't include it at all. So just to interrupt that, someone in the chat said there's nothing related to sets in PCRS. Uh, oh, really? If that's the case, um, you can ignore the materials uh, in the slides that talk about sets. Uh, if it isn't talked about in in lecture, then it's probably not going to be in the midterm. Okay, then then we'll just talk about tuples and lists for now. Okay, so here we have an example of accessing items from list tuple list tuples and sets. Unfortunately, there is sets in this example, so. but you guys can still try it out if you're up to it. So basically this code that was written, um, basically here we, have, we declared a list and a tuple, and here we, we wrote, um, I have a variable called my x, which equals my list at the index two plus my tuple at the index one. So my list at the index two would be the value three because this is zero and then this is index one, which is two. And then this is the index two, which is three. And then my tuple at index one would be the value two. So this would simply evaluate to three plus two, which is five. My sublist is basically using the indexing method, which is should be a review from when you learned when you guys learned strings. So um, here it starts at index two, and then it goes all the way to index five, not including index five. And then we skip. We only include every second item, so it only includes three and one. So then, and then here we have a random variable called truth variable that checks whether four is in my list and four is in the, va the value my tuple and my list count four is bigger than one, which basically determines whether the number four appears in the list more than once. And basically here from lines 15 to 17, we print out the values of all of these variables we created. So we would get for the first, for line 15, the output would be the value of my X is five. My cool sublist would be a list that just includes the values three and one. And line 17, it would just be true, as you can see here in the next slide. So if you want to change items from a in a list or in the list, you can use the append method to add new items to the end of the list and the insert method to add items at a specific index. So, all right, Sung, did you want to say something? I, uh, that wasn't me. I think oh, sorry, I just heard I was my... not muted. Okay. No, I'll just mute them. It's okay. You can continue. Okay, so I was saying that you can use the append method to add items to the end of the list and the insert method to add items at a specific index. So the syntax for that would be like my list dot append and in brackets you would put the item you want to put at the end of the list or my list dot insert index item where index is a number between 
zero and the length of the list and item would be the item you want to insert at the index. You can use the remove method to remove the first occurrence of an item from the list. And the syntax would be my list dot remove item. You can use the pop method to remove an item at a specific index of the list. So that would be my list dot pop index. And then indexing can also be used to change the value stored in specific specific indexes of the list. So for example, you would be like, you can use the code like my list at index like two equals something else, even though you, you declared it to be something already. And tuples can be changed without converting them to a list first. So if you want to change the values of the tuple, you would have to convert it to a list. And we can just ignore the thing about sets because Okay, so here's oh. another example where, Sorry. oh yeah. Uh, for the list method dot index. Yeah. Um, when there's no item, uh, it actually gives a value error instead of negative one uh, dot index method. Really? Yeah. Uh, I saw in the uh -huh. comments uh, notified me. Oh. But thanks for catching that. Yeah, you're totally correct. Okay, then we will, I guess after the seminar, I'll have to go change the slides and then post an updated version somewhere. But hopefully. All right, I'll just edit it now. Okay. Okay, so here's an example that we want to go through. It does involve sets, but I don't know. Do you guys want to do the example with the sets or like, do you guys just want to skip this example because it has sets? Uh, I, let's just do, yeah, do the, do the, do the parts not including sets. Yeah. Okay. So. So basically in line seven and eight, we declare a tuple in the list with the exact same numbers in it. So to remove, basically um, here from lines 11 till 16, we remove four from the list and the tuple. So to do that, I used pop method. And then for the, for the to do this for the tuple, I had to create a new list convert it to the list using this list keyword over here. And then I simply removed for using the remove method for list. And then I converted it back into a tuple right here in line 16. Then I added a hundred to each collect to the end of each collection. So my list append a hundred adds a hundred. Um, then I use the list version of the tuple to append 100 to the end of the tuple and then converted it back to a tuple to update the value of my tuple. And then here is an example where I use indexing to change list items. So here I just use my list f4 equals 312 and my list has zero equals negative eight. So do you guys want to write out and chat the values of my list and my tuple?
Okay, so um, going back to this example, my tuple should have the elements 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 100 in that order. And then my list should equal negative 8, 2, 3, 5, 312, 7, 8, and, and 100 in this specific order because of the indexes. I changed it to negative the index, the value at index 0 to negative 8 and the value at index 4 to 312. So that's why these are the values of my list and my tuple. Uh, okay, so when you want to iterate through all the values inside a list or a tuple, you can use a for loop if you want to access every single element or every nth element of the of the list or the tuple where n is a positive integer. The while loops work if you need to break out of the loop before iterating through every item in the collection. And we also discovered a shortcut to creating a list from another one using a for loop. So assume that we previously declared an, an initialize a list variable called list one, wrote a method called change with the parameter item that can have that returns some other value based on the parameter. And we also wrote a method called check something with the parameter item that can check whether something about its parameter is true. So the syntax over here, list two equals change x for x in list one is a shortcut to this, this code snippet with three lines where we in it, where we declare and initialize a variable called list two with an empty list, and then take every, and then use a for loop to go through every value in list one, and then append the changed value into list two. Um, let's see. Question. Yes. Uh, what does change x stand for again? I mean, uh, I'm kind of confused about that part. Okay, so basically, it's just a val it's just a method that we wrote that can take the parameter x and then make some change to it or append it into a concatenate into a string or add it to another number or something like that and then return the value that it changed. I see. Does that make more sense? Yeah. Okay. So the syntax change x for x in this one, if check something x, is a shortcut to this four line code snippet that basically um, initialize and declares an empty, a variable called list two with an empty list. And then for every, and then uses a for loop to iterate through every item in list one. And then it checks whether something about x is true. And then if it is true, then that item in list one is appended into list two of uh, the list if statement is optional and change x can return the parameter x itself without actually changing it i.e the syntax list two equals x for x in list one is completely valid okay here's another example and after i go through it it you guys can predict the output in the chat. So basically we have a list of different tuples with basically these grocery store vegetables and fruits. Um, so basically in the tuple, we have the name of the item and then we have the number of, of the item in the inventory and then we have the price of each unit. So for the first for the first part from lines 9 to 11 we print out the items in order and the information about them be in the format like in the format saying like the quantity of item the quantity of the item name will be ordered and the total price would be the quantity times the unit price in dollars so maybe you can like print out a few um you can got you guys can like type in the chat whether you can 
You guys can just type out in the chat like what might be the output of some of these. You don't have to type it out for every single one. Yes, that is correct for the apples. Mm. So for the next part, uh, we run into a problem where we can't really order everything because everything costs more than $2,000 and our budget is $2,000. So we created a variable called total price, which we will use to add up the price of the things that we do plan on ordering. And then we have another, we have a variable called budget, which is 2000 for the $2,000. And then we have another variable called index of last item included. So far, we initialize it to negative one because after including an item, we will basically increase it by one each time. So then we used a while loop to iterate through every item. And then every item until the total price is less than the value of budget. So basically for every item, we, we increase the index of the last item included by one, and then we add the, the total price where we multiply, um, we multi for every tuple, we multiply the value at index one with the value at index two. So for example, if the, the item, the order at index at last item included is like the apples, then we would be multiplying 600 by 0 0.50 to calculate the total price of the apples. And then we keep doing this until the total price is greater than or equal to the value of budget. And then after from lines 23 to 26, we create a list of items that are not included and then we print them out. So I named the variable items to skip and then it is a list consisting of item details. What is that? Item details are zero for item details in order of index of last item included all the way till the end of the list. So basically item details starts from is, is, is a tuple in order, starting from the index of last item included and goes all the way to the end of the list order. And then we just want to include the name of the item. That's why here it says item details at zero. I think if you make it inclusive, that would also work as well, but I just didn't write it like that for this example. But I think the example would still work if you made it inclusive. And then um, I create a little for loop and then iterating through every item that we want to skip. And then it prints out the item will not be ordered today. So the output of this example would basically be for the first for loop where we print out everything, a list of everything we want to order, it will basically print out this. And then 
for the second for loop. They will print out mushrooms will not be ordered today. Butternut squash will not be ordered. Lemons all the way to yams because everything that came before mushrooms adds up to the budget price. So you can also join a bunch of collections together using, you can use the plus operator to create a new list or tuple containing items into existing lists or tuples. So the syntax for that will be collection three equals collection one plus collection two, where collection one and collection two are either both lists or both tuples. You can't use the plus operator to join a tuple with a list. You can use the star or the asterisk operator to create a new list or tuple containing items from another list or tuple repeated n times, or n is a positive integer. So the syntax for that would be collection two equals collection one times n. And here I just wrote it as five as an example. So in this example, collection two contains all the items in collection one repeated five times. And each repetition keeps the items in the same order as they were defined in the collection one. Mm. Then we also have the extend method, which can be used to add all elements from one list to the end of another list. And the syntax for that would be list one extends list two, like this. And then here is joining two sets together, but I'm not really going to talk about this one. Okay, so Sung, can, do you want to start talking about dictionaries? Sure. Um, uh, should I present or? Mm, yeah, anyway. I feel like. Okay. Yeah, I think you can start screen sharing if you want. All right. Yeah. I show. Wait. I use uh, Google Slides. Oh, there you go. All right, dictionaries. So um, dictionaries are just like any other co uh, collections, but they just store a collection of key value pairs. Uh, the dictionary cannot contain repeats of the same keys. Uh, so it can't contain, for this example, let's say, it can't contain name and Teresa and another pair that's called name and sung. Uh, and keys must be an immutable type. So the key keys can be strings, numbers, or tuples. The values can be any of any type. Uh, they can be lists or even dictionaries. So in an example here, we have student one, which has a key, key of name and a value of Teresa, uh, key of school and University of Toronto, and so on. Uh, there's another way to define a dictionary, which is called the Python dict. And then in brackets, we have name equals and sound school equals University of Toronto, comma program study equals computer science. Uh, accessing an item, uh, it's very simple. They can be accessed by using keys. For example, we can have my dict and then in square brackets, you have a key and then n square bracket. It, you can also do a dot get method. Uh, keys method returns a list of all dictionary keys, which is based on the initialization of uh, any keys added to the dictionary after initialization. So uh, uh, my dict keys would have contain a list of the keys in in this dictionary. 
Uh, similar, you can get the values, a uh, list of values using dot values method. Um, values can by uh, can be changed using uh, using keys. So you can do uh, my dict and then access it using the key, and then you can assign it to something else. The new key value pairs can be ad added using keys. So a new entry can be made by uh, assigning a new new key name and then uh, equals to a value of something. So this this uh, dictionary would have a new entry called new key name and then the value of something. Update method can change values of uh, existing keys and add new key value pairs. So it's similar to the ones above, but you just have a different way of calling it. So my dict update and then key name to something else. And uh, the, the new value of where the key is key name would have the value of something else. Same thing as doing this one. Uh, the pop and then key name will remove a specific key and its value from the dictionary. So you can remove an entire entry using just the pop method. You can also use loops in dictionaries. So uh, using for in syntax, so for x in a dictionary, this x value will be the keys of the dictionaries. So you can do something with the keys, or you can even get the values using uh, this axis uh, syntax right here. Uh, if I'm going too fast, you can just uh, shout. Uh, we'll go through an example. So we have three dictionaries here. We have one item one, which is which contains a name apple, unit price 0 0.5, quantity 600. And, and these two items contain two, two separate uh, um, grocery store inventory. Uh, my items is a tuple of these three dictionaries. And I want to... Hey, Song. Yeah, sorry. Sorry to interrupt, but can you like zoom in a little bit? Because I can't oh, really okay. what's on the screen. Yeah, no worries. Hopefully this is better. Yeah, it looks a lot better. All right. So what happens if I uh, do this code right here? So for item in I my items, I'm going to print item and uh, name. So just give a... Uh, quick one or two minutes just for someone to type it in the chat. Uh, yep, yeah, uh, pretty much, Jonah. Uh, so it'll be split. Uh, it'll print out uh, apple, avocados, broccoli, all in different lines. Uh, yeah, uh, I guess I could explain. Uh, reiterate through each item. Uh, this value takes in the dictionary uh, for each item, and this uh, this syntax just gets the name from the dictionaries. Hope that's simple enough. And we print a new line. Um, then we get the keys from item one, call it K one, and we get the values, call it V one. Can someone? Uh, 
tell me what these two uh, print out. Two lists. Yeah, I, I guess I don't really need to uh, say much. <laughs> so it'll print out the two lists. For the, uh, so the first list would contain name, unit price, and quantity. The second list will contain the values of item one. So it'll contain Apple 0 0.5 and 600. So what we're going to do now is uh, for item one, uh, where the key is tax, I'm going to set that to 0 0.05. And these two values would actually update because um, there are actually views of the list of keys. Um, so what we would have as the new uh, new key key and K1 and V1 is that K1 would have name, unit price, quantity, and tax. And V1 would also have Apple 0 0.5, 600, and 0 0.05. Yeah, and those are what you see here. I hope that's good. Now we'll go to a review of files. Um, so files, uh, Python has a built-in me method called open which has a, uh, which takes into arguments called file name and mode, and it returns a file object. Uh, these are both strings. The possible values are uh, for mode is R for read. Uh, uh, this is the default value, and it opens a file for reading text data and returns error if the file doesn't exist. A uh, is represents append. It op opens a file for writing text data to the end of the file, and it creates the file if the file doesn't exist with the file name. The W is write, and it opens the file to override existing content in a text file, and it creates the file if it does not exist. Same with A. And X is for create, and it simply just creates the file. And it returns error if it doesn't exist. Oh, a file exists, sorry. Uh, I'm reading a comment here. Is there a built-in function that converts a list to dictionary? Um, I don't think so, because lists are just uh, they don't have key values, whereas dictionary does. If it, uh, but if it does exist, I'm ass I'm assuming that it, it's not used frequently, so I don't I wouldn't worry about that. But if you're curious, I would still Google it. Um, so reading a file, after opening a file with the syntax, uh, my file equals open file name and R, you can read from it. So there's two ma ways of, main ways of reading from a file. Um, the first way is called read function or method. Uh, read n will read from, read the first n characters of the file and returns it as a string. N is an optional parameter, and if it is is it is not included, then all text in the file is read and returned. Pretty self-explanatory. And read line is a method that reads from the first n lines of the file and it returns that as a string. And, sorry, n is optional, and if it isn't, if it is not included, only one file is read. Oh, only one line. One line is right. So you can have uh, 
my file content assigned to my file dot readline, or you can supply uh, an integer in. Uh, you can also write to a file. So after, op after opening a file with syntax, my file open file name and then uh, string A or W, you can write to it. So write method will write the string value in the text parameter to the file. So this is a string and it'll this method will write to the file called my file. You can also do write lines, which is, uh, which takes in a list of lines and uh, it'll just write every string in the list of lines parameter to the file in the order they are listed. And we can also, uh, we, we should always close files when we open them. Um, so the reason we close them is uh, it reduces the amount of memory uh, amount of RAM your program uses. Uh, when you write to a file, many changes to a file do not go into effect until after the file is closed. So if your program edits a file and you leave it open and read from the same file, the program won't see the edits. And some operating system actually locks open files. So other programs that use the same file won't be able to work properly. And uh, a course called C69 also goes into depth about uh, file systems. So if you're interested, I recommend taking it. Uh, and it's just the one method called doc close, but it's very easy to lose marks if you don't, uh, if you miss this one. All right, so we'll go through an example. So suppose we have a file called readme.txt that contains the following. Good luck on the CSEA OA test. What is the output of the following code and what contents should be in the new text file? So we'll look at it together. All right, uh, so first line we're Oh, oh, opening readme.txt and where we have the mode called r which is for read and we have a variable called lines and line which actually reads the first line and we have this condition here a while loop so while line is not none and hey, yeah sorry to interrupt, oh sorry can you yeah. zoom in again yeah. <laughs> my bad um, so if line is not none and length is greater than zero, so we know that there are actually lines to be read, we will print the line and we'll do this uh, operation and then we'll read, read it again. Uh, could someone tell me uh, what's, what's the output of this loop here is? Uh, the question is, what will this print? What will it print? 
our output. So this is the readme file. Anyone else have a guess? Uh, I guess not. So um, it's true that the uh, lines list will be modified, uh, but uh, we should also output the line, right? So we're reading from the first line, uh, which is uh, see it, good luck. And then line is not none and the length is great, uh, not zero. So we'll print the print the first line, then we'll append this part, which is just uh, appending A to the start of line. And then we're taking the, we're removing the first, we don't care about the first element, right? The splicing. So we just remove this part and assign this good luck to the lines array or list, sorry. And then we'll read the second line. And similarly, it passes this condition. It prints it, and it uh, lines append uh, this string. And similar for this one. And for the last part, there is no uh, no other line. So what this will be valued is actually none. So this will not pass. So the print is just this part. Good luck on the CSC AOA test. And the, yep, the whole text. And the lines list will also contain, contain the list of these strings. Yeah, I won't type it out, but you get my point. So it'll the first element will contain good luck. Second will contain on the and CSCA way test. So then we'll close the file. Would wouldn't mine be empty string at the end? Um, I think you're right. Yeah, it should be empty string. Sorry, my bad. Uh, that's why we also have this condition, I guess. So length of line will be zero. So it will still uh, not pass the while condition. Okay. Um, then we'll print uh, a new line. And then we'll print the string of lines, uh, which is a, a, a list of arrays, right? A, a list of the string, right? So good luck. On the test. Uh, here's a trick question. Or uh, so we'll open the file again, but we'll have the mode as A, and then I'll write to it. You can do it. Then I'll write the lines. You can do it. Uh, this list times five, and then we'll close it. Uh, and then I'll open the file again uh, using the W 
mode. And then I'll write this string, and then times five. And then close it again. So uh, can someone guess or tell me uh, what the resulting file should be for the readme? Yep, you're right. Uh, it'll just print five lines of A, 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 and then a new line. Uh, this is because the write would overwrite anything that's written previously on the readme. So whatever this was, uh, this can be ignored. And that's it. Uh, so quick summary. Oh, should we take a break first? Yeah, we can take like maybe a five minute break. All right, let's take a, I'll, we'll come back at uh, 5.06. Okay.
Uh, so um, there's something I missed, uh, which is pretty important, actually. Um, so uh, let's see, let's see. When when we're printing line, this line is has the value of uh, um, for when we read the first line, we're reading good luck, but this file actually contains a hidden symbol, which is the new line character, right? And when Python prints this out, it it just it's the same as pressing enter on your keyboard. So when Python prints line, it's same as printing good luck and then pressing enter. Similarly, on the second line, it's reading on the, it's actually reading on the with the new line character. So it's actually pressing enter here. Uh, and the CSCA08 test, um, Let's assume that there is no new line after this after this text. Uh, for example, here, let's assume there is no new line character here. Then we can assume that uh, there will be no new line after CSCA08 test. So it'll, the print will just go to the next line. And we're printing the new line here again. So, uh, when Python will normally print here at line 17, it'll print on the line, line here. And these, these characters uh, would actually have to print good luck slash n on the slash n. And since we assume there is no slash n after the third line, we can leave this here. So that's just one thing I missed. Hope that clarifies. Uh, solution here. All right, well, we'll go through a quick summary. Um, we won't go too depth, uh, too much in depth in, to, into this, but uh, a list is uh, changeable or mutable. So you can edit the elements in the list or insert it or remove it. You can uh, insert, remove items in lists or sets, but you're not taking up sets. And lists uh, and tuples, uh, they allow duplicate items. Um, they can, uh, items in the uh, structure can be accessed by indexing and the order is uh, defined. Uh, meanwhile, dictionaries, uh, they don't have a specific order. Um, so for built-in methods for lists and uh, tuples, they can add item to the end of the collection called append. They can add item. Uh, this is for sets, sorry. Uh, they can insert at the index um, of an item. Uh, they can extend the collection. So it adds all the items in collection two to the end of the collection. Uh, it can um the sets uh, we can remove an item from the list and we can also pop uh, the items at the end of the list mm. and we can also count the number of items uh, in in the collection using dot count we can index an item and we can get the length of the collection Hopefully it's all clear. For dictionaries, we can get the keys, a list of keys using dot keys, get the values, and we can update. We can also pop, uh, uh, we can remove a key value pair using pop and then a key name. For files, we can open a file name, uh, a file uh, with a mode um, we can read, uh, read a line, a uh, read a read n characters of a file, or if it's not in, if n is not included, we'll read all the characters. 
for read line. If n is included, we'll read the first n lines of the uh, files. If it is not included, um, then it'll read just one line. The write uh, just writes a, a string to the file. Write lines, it'll write the list of lines in the order of the list. And finally close, we'll just close this, close the file. Uh, we'll go through some practice questions. Uh, they're likely to be similar to your midterms. So it is important that you follow along. So the first question is, um, oh, do you want to go, go through them, Teresa? Um, at least for the first one. Or the yeah, one sure, three. I can, I can. I can do it. Um, so for this first example, um, we just want you to be able to print, determine what is the output of the print statement at the end of each code sample. So the first one is basically just comparing two tuples, and then the second one is comparing two sets. So what might be the output of each one? You guys can just write it in the chat if you guys want to participate, or you can write it on a piece of paper. Oh yeah, they didn't cover sets. I <laughs> forgot. Oh yeah, you guys didn't cover sets. I I guess yeah, it is false, but uh, let's go on to the next question. That is correct, though. Yeah, because obviously the order matters and uh, tuples they aren't equivalent. All right. Yeah, you can do question two. Okay, so for the next question, we have two lists, and then in the first in the first code sample, um, we append collection two into the list called collect one, and then we print out collect one, and then in the second code sample, we extend it instead of appending it. So can you guys like, you guys want to print out determine what what the value of collect one would be? You can guys can just type out what like print collect one would print out in the chat. Yep, so uh, collect two will be nested in the last element of collect one. Uh, how about for extent?
Yep. Uh, extend will just uh, concatenate the, the collect two into collect one. So it will just be one uh, list containing 20, 55, 90, 80, a negative 6, 5, 5, 4, 2, 5, 6, 3, 9, 8, negative 12, 44. Uh, so that's just one difference for append and extend. Append will just take this element and take this collect two and just shove it in the last element collect one. Meanwhile, extend will just concatenate two lists into collect one. Cool. Yeah. You go to this one. Okay, so for this question, you guys might want to open up like a text editor or wing ID or some other program. And then you guys need, should, this question is asking you guys to write a function called generate timetable that generates a weekly timetable given a list of information about scheduled classes. You can also write helper functions. So the parameters of this generate timetable function, um, the first one is class info. It's a list of tuples containing a string of the course code and at least one other tuple containing information about scheduled course activities. The tuples with information about the course activity contains a string of the description of the course activity followed by a string of the day of the week the activity occurs followed by a number between 0 and 23, indicating the start time, and followed by a number between 0 and 23, indicating the end time. So for example, this tuple called that has a string called course name, and then, in, and then the next index is a tuple that has active, a string called activity1, and then followed by the day of the week, which that it's scheduled on, which is Monday. And then the start time, which is nine, which is which indicates nine a.m. And then followed by um, the end time, which is ten, which is ten a.m. And then it has another tuple called activity two, with a string called activity two. And then followed by the a string indicating when it's scheduled, which is Wednesday. And then it's scheduled from nine a.m. to eleven a.m. So. For the times, you will, you will all, you can always expect it to begin at a specific, like on the hour. So, for example, you can expect activities to never start or end at nine twelve, and also you can also expect activities to not extend from like Monday to Tuesday. So, if it's on Monday, it's just on Monday. <laughs> and also, class activities will never be scheduled on weekends. And this function should return a string containing information about the weekly timetable. The string contains each day of the week except for weekends, and each day includes the class's activities scheduled for it and the time period it occurs. And each class activity is separated by this, um, I'm not sure what this character is called, but this long line character. And each and every day schedule will be printed on a single line. So Based on, can you go to the next slide? Okay, so this is an example of someone's schedule. So the list contains a tuple that says, that has information about the scheduled activities for CSC 808. So they have a tuple that where they have a lecture on Monday from 10 to 12, and then a lecture on Thursday from 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. lecture, and then they have an, they have CSEA 67, and then they have a lecture on Monday from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. And then they have a tutorial on Wednesday from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. And then for Matt A31, they have a lecture on Wednesday from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. And a tutorial on Thursday from 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. So basically the output would be Monday followed by the CSE A08 lecture information, and then there would be that long line character, 
And then there will be the CSC A67 lecture information because both of these classes have lectures scheduled on a Monday. And then there will be a new line followed by Tuesday's lectures, which is nothing. And then Wednesday, there will be more information about tutorials and lectures. And then Thursday, there's more information. And then Friday has nothing because nothing's scheduled on Friday. So if you guys want to work on this using an IDE or a text editor, and then we can take it up in like five to 10 minutes. And meanwhile, if you have any any questions at all, uh, feel free to speak up or type it in the chat.
All right. Uh, hope you, all, you guys all had a time to think about it and come up with a solution. Uh, Teresa, do you want to talk about the code here? Teresa? I think she's gone. Sorry, I didn't know I was muted. Oh, that's all right. Okay, yeah, this is very awkward because I was talking. <laughs> okay, so for the generate timetable method, um, I just really quickly wrote a doc string, but please don't follow my example when it comes to writing the doc strings. Um, you are expected to put more examples in the doc string for a generate timetable function. Um, so first I made a helper method called format time that takes the hour, which is an integer and then returns a string, a string with the formatted time, um, based on whether it's in the morning or the afternoon. So if it's in the afternoon, I would end it off with PM. And if it's in the morning, it would end with AM. So basically it first checks if hour is between is strictly bigger than 12 and strictly less than 24. And if it is, it would return a string with the hour minus 12 plus, and then concatenated with 0, 0 p.m. And then if it's not between 12 and 24, it checks whether it's strictly bigger than zero and strictly less than 12. And if that's the case, then it would just return a string of the value of the hour concatenated with the 00, 00 a.m. to indicate that it's in the morning. Then it checks if the hour equals 12. And if it is, then you just return 12 p.m. And if it equals zero, then you return 12 a.m. And if it's not between zero and 24, then you just return an empty string because that's not really like, like a time in the 24 hour clock. Anyway, so, in the generate timetable function, I created a tuple called days, which has all the weekdays in a single week. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And I created a string variable called result, which is just, and I initialize it to an empty string. Then I created a for loop going through all the days in days. So I just wrote here for day in days. Um, so for the result, I, I concatenated the day and then I put a colon. Then for, then for each, um, value in the class info parameter, which is a list. And then going from, I created, I, I wrote another for loop going from one all the way to the length of the tuple because I don't want mm, the value of the class. I don't really want to check the value of the class name, and I just want to check the information about the activity. Then I check if the day is in the tuple about the class activity. So for example, for CSE 808, if like the day is inside the tuple about the lecture, happening on Monday from 10 to 12, if like the day is in it, meaning that like it contains the value of day. So in the case of day equals Monday, then this if statement would be true. But if it's like the Thursday one and the day is Monday, then, then it would evaluate as false. And if it evaluates as true, then we add that line string and then we add the name of the the name of the course and then we add a space then we add the name the name of the class activity uh days could also be a list but i just made it a tuple because i don't really intend to change it um then i put a space and then I call the format time helper helper function to take the times 
in this tuple. And so I do it for the start time and then I also do it for the end time. And then after I concatenate that, I concatenate the new line string at the end of every single after each day is after I'm done concatenating the classes for each day. And then after I'm done, I return the result. So basically, if Sung, can you go back to the slides, please? Huh? Really, so. mm. Let's see. Uh, the next slide. So basically, uh. Basically, what the code did here was after um, concatenating um, the information of the Monday classes, it it print it add it concatenated the new line character, and then concaten tried concatenating information about Tuesday classes, except there weren't any. And then for Wednesday classes, it concatenated the A sixty seven tutorial and A thirty one lecture, and there was a new line character. And then a co-candidate activities occurring on Thursday, which was the A A08 lecture and the A31 tutorial. And then there's a new line character. And then it tried co-candidating activities happening on Friday, except there weren't any. So that's how the code works. You guys have any questions or comments about this? Because I feel like some things might not be very clear. Clear. Okay, so we can just go to the nice. next question then. Okay, so the next question, you guys would want to use a text editor for this again, but basically it's asking you to implement the following function called word pattern. So basically in the doc string, it says given a pattern and a word list, determine if the word list follows the same pattern. And that is to say, ensure that pattern at an index called j equals pattern at an index k only when words at that at the index j equals words at the index k and pattern at the index j does not equal pattern at the index k means that words at j does not equal words at k and basically here j and k are completely different numbers And for a precondition, you can assume that the pattern is all lowercase letters. So for this example, the, in the doc string, if the word pattern is a a a a, and the word and the list of words is just cat 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 and cat. Since all, since the word pattern expects every single word in the list to be the exact same, and the words in the list cat 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 are all the same it would be true and then word pattern y o o x um and then the word list is dog cat cat fish so dog would be related to the letter y cat will be related to the letter o and fish will be related to the letter x so this prints out the result as true and then if the word pattern is x y but the word list is cat cat we already relayed cat to the letter X, but but then so we expect the word in the list to not be cat, but it's still cat, so it's false. And then here in the last example, if the word pattern is X O O X, we relate to the word from the word list dog to the letter X and cat to the letter O. So since the word pattern ends with the letter X, we expect we expect the last word in the word list to be dog, but it's fish, so it's false. So you guys can have five to 10 minutes to implement this function in a text editor, and then we can take it up.
Right? I think it's about time we take it up. Um. Okay, so for the solution that I wrote here, you guys don't have to follow the solution exactly. Like if you use the dictionary, then instead of a list for pattern word pairs, that totally works as well. But basically I created, I defined and initialized a new variable called pattern word pairs with this empty list. Then I checked if the length of the pattern is the is different from the length of the words list. And if it's different, then I return false because there's no way that um, the word pattern can be similar to the words list if there's more, if there's a different number of words in the words list compared to the word pattern. I mean, letters in the word pattern. And if it is the same, then I go and check whether every word in the word list can be matched up to a single character in pattern and if to determine whether it matches. So I start by writing a for loop checking um, in the pattern, every character in the pattern. And I say if, and I write an if statement saying if the tuple pattern at i and then words at the index i is not in the pattern word pairs, then I check every pair, every tuple in the pattern word pairs um, list and say if the pair at zero equals pattern at index i or pair at one equals words at i, I return false because, because um, the pattern, the word, the pattern word pair is not inside this list it's called pattern word pairs, but there's already a letter. There's already a letter in the pattern. There's already, sorry, the pat the letter in pattern at i is in a, a pair that exists, or the word is in one of the pairs that exists. But this basically checks whether there's like a letter that doesn't have the same word in it already, and then you return false. And if you don't return false, then you just append the pattern word pair, which is just a tuple that has the pattern and the word. And then basically, if it doesn't return false, then you just return true at the end. Is there anything that was confusing about my explanation? Because I stuttered quite a bit. So I suggest uh, you guys to come up with a solution on your own. Um, there is actually a, a more efficient solution than this. So it would be a great exercise if you can uh, think about that uh, after this session. Yeah. But uh, I think there's no questions. Um, don't be afraid, guys. Just uh, if you're confused about anything, just give us a hand. Uh, just ask us, ask us a question. But uh, we'll move on to question five. So, uh, sorry, it's a little blurry, but this question, uh, it's, it's quite useful. Um, so let's see. Well, Brian, Brian built some tools to work with grade files. The files consist of a name, a course, and a grade separated by commas, one grade per line. After the grade data uh, is a line starting with dash, 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 and then the other data. Mm. Uh, but we don't care about the, the data after this dash, dash, dash. A sample file might look something like this. So we have on one line, we have Alice, CSCA08, and 99, meaning that Alice got 99 on CSCA08. 
Bob had a Bob, comma, CSCA 08 at 70, and so on. Uh, Brian wrote a function called build marks dict, and that regret, uh, reads a grade file and returns it into a dictionary that maps student names to dictionary mappings, um, dictionaries mapping course to grades. A sample dictionary of that type might look something like this. So Alice uh, on CSEA 08, she got a 99, on META 31, they got a 95, and on CSEA 48, they got an 85. Uh, and comma, uh, Bob got 70 on CSEA 08 and 50 on CSEA 48. And Carol got uh, 60 on ABCA 1. That's it. So uh, the issue was that if you guys experienced this before, or maybe not, but the code mangler uh, got hold of Brian's code and mangled the entire function of uh, a build marks. Dict. So your task is to reassemble the code uh, for this function and which takes in the input file. The list of lines is here. Uh, I'll give you guys five minutes to work on it. And uh, one thing to note is don't get overwhelmed. Um, it's easy to see a bunch of lines and uh, just, just get confused. But what I suggest is come up with a logic that uh, of this function before looking at the lines and then see uh, what kind of lines uh, what kind of lines are f similar to what you have in your logic that you have in your mind. Uh, uh, is there a way to display two slides at once? But uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just show this line. Uh, if you want me to go back, then just let me know in the chat. I'll come back in 556.
Um, hopefully you guys had a, came up with a solution on your own. Um, but uh, let's go over what I did at least. So the first thing to think about is what is the first line that should appear in the function? So we want to obviously, the input file is already given to us. And um, uh, we want to uh, go iterate through the input lines, right? So let's look at the, what I did. Um, Gonna put this on split screen. To zoom. Okay, that's not great, but hopefully you can see. And um, so I want to iterate through a list of lines, but I also want to um, look at what type of variable names are there. And these type of uh, scrambler questions, uh, a lot of the hints are given by the variable names. So we have a dictionary called uh, by a student name and the grade they got. So likely, the dictionary name will be contain student to something. And we have these two return variables and I can see course to average. Our, our function, our uh, example doesn't contain any averages. So most likely we'll return some, some student to marks, right? And initially uh, we have student to marks here on the left side but we build marks dict. That's the function we are trying to create. And this question doesn't require any recursion. So this line just isn't necessary. And student to marks, uh, square bracket student. Well, we haven't initialized it. So we will likely use this line here. And that's what I did. We first initialized it. And my logic is that um, we iterate through each line going through each student. And if Alice exists, uh, if Alice does not exist in student to marks, then I want to add him or, or add them to the dictionary. And the values can be assigned later. Uh, for this midterm, uh, you should be, you should all be very comfortable with um, creating dictionaries from a stream of strings or a stream of um, information like this file over here or even a list. Uh, so we obviously need some kind of loop to go through each line in the string, uh, in the file, right? The only loop that contains this is this while loop here. So while not input line start with dash, dash, dash. That's the delimiter. So that's when we want to stop reading the file, right? We want to read only the upper section. So after this while loop, um, I want to read the line, the strip and the split. This immediately just pops out to me because we want to uh, filter each input line we read. So there might be some spaces after the line or before the line that we would just want to get rid of. Then we want to split it into student grade, course and grade. Then we can actually use this student course and grade info. Um, so that's, uh, after that, that's where our uh, knowledge of, about uh, creating dictionaries come in. So if student is not in the, in the dictionary, so we need an if statement. 
uh, so this one. And if student is in the uh, dictionary, we want to retrieve that dictionary value. So if 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 this value is already initialized, we want to retrieve it. If it's not, we want to assign the value CSCA weight and then pair with 99. So that's what I have. Uh, if student not in student to marks, we assign course to grade, uh, which is this one, uh, student, student to marks, student. Else, we assign a new value, a new dictionary value to course to grade. Uh, and then uh, we, since, since either case we have the course to grade initialized, we want to as assign the course, uh, we want to assign the, the grade to the actual course for the student. So a line that does that is this line right here. So after the course to grade is initialized, we want to assign the foot of the grade value to the course. And after we as assign that value, we can actually assign that back to the students. So uh, this line, student to marks, student equals course to grade, which is the last line over here. And then after that, you should go through all, uh, after that, this uh, function should go through all the list of lines, go through all the students, assign the appropriate values, appropriate course to grade values for each student. And after that, we can return the student to marks. Um, one thing to note is that uh, this is not a one in all solution. So you can, in this code scrambler questions, you can actually have multiple solutions. We, uh, for example, want to put it here. So let's see. Uh, Actually, I need these brackets. So another possible solution is that we don't need this else statement and we can initialize it over here. That'll do the same thing. So if student is actually in the student to marks dictionary, we can assign course to grade to the appropriate value of the, uh, of the dictionary. And um, yeah, another solution is to uh, put these two lines into here and this one to here. This will do the same thing. You, uh, you can have a duplicate code. Uh, I think that should be fine think they won't take off marks, but uh, you should ask the prof for the TA just in case. No, I don't have to assign it back to student to marks because the dictionaries are changeable or mutable. So if I change the grade here, it automatically changes the grade in the student to marks dictionary value. I hope that made sense. If you guys have any questions, feel free to uh, raise your voice. But other than that, uh, if you guys have any questions about the review seminar overall, um, feel free to raise a voice. And, but uh, that's it for the session. Uh, good luck on your midterm. And yeah, see ya. Yeah, good luck, everyone.
All right, I think uh, we can stop the recording, right? Teresa, I think you're on mute. Okay.